Welcome to the Central Reach ABA On Call Podcast. We do insist upon quick reinforcement. Thought-provoking conversation, ideas, and trends in the applied behavior analysis industry. With this type of arrangement of material, you can learn the same amount in about half the time with half the effort. Now, here are your hosts, Drs. Rick Abina and Doug Kostowitz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 6. We are going to discuss the intersection of parenting and ABA. Doug, I have it on good authority that you have kids. Is that true? Well, no, I don't. I don't have kids. I have kid. You kid, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Less than... than multiples, just one. Not plural, singular. Right. So you are a parent and you have worked with, as a matter of fact, in your career you've done parenting. I have, for full disclosure, I am also a father of three. And this is something that for our audience, some of our audience will have their own children, but yet I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that almost everybody works with, uh, if not working with families, you're in a center and you're probably interacting with families on some level. Yes, that, uh, as you mentioned, I spent a uh, long time working with families in a variety of levels working with kids, uh, whether they were foster parents, biological parents, or adoptive parents. And of course, kids who are in schools, if you're a teacher, if you're consulting with schools, there are guardians and parents of these kids they go home to. So this is an important topic. And the first um, aspect of ABA we're going to talk about is the notion of positive reinforcement. I think that Thinking about positive reinforcement in parenting is always difficult because these are your kids and or I'm speaking from my history here. These are your kids and there's a lot of other things going on and you're busy and it's hard to always use positive reinforcement effectively. And too often even I get stuck in those moments where you let the things that they should be doing anyway go and wait for something else to happen that catches your attention. Whereas if we made a concerted effort to provide positive reinforcement in the form of attention, uh, tangible, on some schedule, for those run-of-the-mill things, we actually strengthen behavior. And I'm sure, Rick, and you and I have had conversations in the past that we're, you know, we're distracted when we're doing these things. But if we could use that more often, it makes such a difference in the house. Mm -hmm. Generation to generation, parenting keeps changing. And one thing that does not change is the basic principles of behavior, such as positive reinforcement. And you know, you, you can't say, well, in today's era, it's is you know, it's so important because it's important in every era and everyone mm-hmm. who's a parent. And as you point out, if we're going to work with parents, one of the first things and a very responsible thing we can do is explain what positive reinforcement is, and not just explain it, but coach them and show them. Now, how do you actually do this? All parents do it. Everybody does it. In fact, you know, we could probably go down this other road, which I'm not going to bring us down this road, but I'll just bring it up. People talk about, oh, uh, you're a behavior analyst, and, and you, know, you know this stuff about parenting, and uh, like somehow you're immune to its effects. Like if you're a, <laughs> you know, a physicist and you know about gravity, you have some special relationship with it. But from your own experience, how would you teach parents about positive reinforcement? How might you coach them and, and walk them through and, and show them wh- how do you purposefully use this incredibly powerful principle of behavior? Well, first, we have to change the focus of the individual. So if you're a parent, and uh, this is something you know I remind myself too, but – what are we looking for? If you're looking for uh, the child to sit down 
and come up with 3,000 pages of Shakespeare before you provide some maybe praise or a pat on the back or a hug, then what you are not doing as often as you could is providing some type of positive reinforcement for any appropriate behavior. I think that we can agree. Kids traditionally do a lot more things appropriately than they do inappropriately. And there's a lot of opportunities. And I think the biggest advice is, what are we looking for? Lower what you're looking for, not towards the inappropriate side, but understand that there's tons of appropriate behaviors that we can catch. And you have things like your attention. You have um, physical contact with your kids. I would tell them, use that as much as you can for the things you want to see more of. Mm -hmm. And rather than waiting for something very, very special, which that's great if it happens, then definitely provide something for it. But lower what you're looking for. Hey, they just walk in the room with a half smile. Great. There's a chance to provide positive reinforcement. Hey, they sat down and you know what? They pushed their chair in. Well, there's a chance. Well, they're supposed to do that anyway. But you know what? Invest your time, energy in that. You're going to get more of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the big piece of advice I would give to parents. One of my favorite examples, I mean, kids are attention-seeking machines. Mm -hmm. And it, I think about young children, and uh, you see this all the time. You, know, the, you, you cover your eyes, and then you, you, you take your hands off of your eyes, and you look at the kid with a shocked expression. That makes them laugh. Then you shut your eyes again, and you open them, and they laugh. And what you're doing and what they're doing is this dance where you know you are interacting with them positively and you are reinforcing them looking at you and, and the attention that they're giving you you're reinforcing that with attention there's so many things that we could do with parents to show them this is how you get more of something and that that has to be number one the number one thing is explaining to parents this thing that we have called positive reinforcement, it's going to help you get more of a behavior that you want. Conversely, if you don't pay attention to it, you get more of what you don't want. Because you end up paying attention to that. So there, that is a, a, you have a great example that if you're doing things that you don't necessarily want, how often we get we quickly provide what you considered attention. It may not look the same, but it's attention. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we start to get more of this other behavior we don't want. It's the same principle. You're providing it, but not for the behavior you necessarily want. So that's, that's, a, that's a really great point. Yeah, a lot of behaviors that we do not want happen because we reinforce them. Whining is a great example. How does whining happen? I don't know. I've I've never I've never actually interacted with whining. <laughs> you, so, you've never um, had that happen to you. No, I, I've never used it, and I've never seen anybody do it. So I, I'm not even familiar with what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> it happens because it works. Mm -hmm. If um, and there's so many other things like that that after and once so there's talking about what reinforcement is, and then. Depending on working with parents, what would be another thing to talk about is when you're talking about positive reinforcement, at some point you gently bring up the notion of reinforcement schedules because that mm -hmm. is a whole nother area oh. that on top of reinforcement, parents need to understand that. Yeah. And, uh, no, you know, I always joke with my students who are eventually going to be teachers. And but I've also talked to parents. We don't clap for a seven year old every time they go to the bathroom often. Right. right. But yet you do that early when a child's first learning to go to the bathroom. You clap and you praise and say, yay. And then what happens is, is that fades for that behavior. We didn't lose the behavior of clapping and saying yay, we just apply it to different behaviors and then fade those over time. And so understanding the schedules and what type of behaviors to focus on 
If it's an acquisition, you provide more reinforcement. If it's a st- more established, you begin to fade that. That is another sk- – I mean that's the next level past just recognizing what to provide reinforcement for. Yeah, and I and that gets into what you were talking about earlier with your example mm-hmm. that if we can – number one, let's get our parents understanding – what is positive reinforcement? Let's put that in their arsenal. And then number two, let's teach them about schedules of reinforcement. If we can do that, we have parents that can be very skillful at getting a lot of behavior that they'd like to see. Moving on to our second topic brings in parenting and negative reinforcement. And we talked a little bit in the first part in some situations, but the importance for parents understanding negative reinforcement is as much for children's behavior, but the effect on our behavior. So you mentioned earlier about whining, which I never have heard before in my life, which we agree. No, what we, when the child's whining, we're tempted to give in and we, we give in the whining goes away. And that relief actually affects us because we're more likely to give in. So we end up teaching through positive reinforcement also the notion of negative reinforcement on our behavior. And when working with parents, I have made it very clear that you know you have these moments where it's a teaching moment. You can't. Give in to that because you're going to end up teaching that that's the okay way to go. I'll tell you what, Doug. Negative reinforcement is such a difficult concept. Just Mm. in everyone who's listening to this can attest to how hard it is. Like think about the first time you've learned about negative reinforcement and then having to teach that to someone who has no background whatsoever it's really helpful to show these in a maybe even a graphic way, but also mm-hmm. use the kind of examples that you're using. That it, it is just critically important that people, the parents, understand when this is happening and when they can identify instances of negative reinforcement, what might else they do. Yeah. So it's not just on giving in. We also have situations when we're frustrated. We've asked a child to do something six, seven, eight times. We begin to, dare I say, yell. And then what happens is the child goes away and does the thing. Guess what? We're teaching them. They are learning through negative reinforcement some bad habits that they just will do what you say and you're learning. I just need to yell louder and then you'll do what I say. And you've got negative reinforcement working both ways Mm -hmm. to not promote a good relationship. And that's why it's critically important, as you mentioned with positive reinforcement, critically important to understand the role of negative reinforcement in the relationship between parents and children. Uh, When we talk about parenting or child rearing, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, parents are responsible for physical development, emotional development, you know, social, intellectual, all of that from when children are very young, when they're infants, all the way up to adulthood. And there is a huge swath of time in there. And these principles are all the time on. They're mm-hmm. going, and you know, with negative reinforcement, that's something that can oftentimes, as you point out, lead us down a path we would rather not go. I still, this is a classic example. When I was, I, I was fortunate in that I came to behavior analysis as an undergrad, and I had my children when I was a behavior analyst. I knew about the principles of behavior, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a, a great parent. But I still remember the time, and you know this isn't the only time I've done this because no one's perfect. But um, in I was living in Michigan. In Meyer is a big store over there, a big box store. We went in there, and 
there we are in a shopping cart. We're getting ready to check out. And, of course, point of sale, they put toys and candy and all kinds of things there. And my, uh, I think it was my daughter and my son. I can't actually remember which one it was. But they're like, I want that. I'm like, no, you can't have that. I want that. No, you can't have that. I want that, whatever it was. Sure enough, I give it to them. And that negative reinforcement happened. And guess what happened the next time we were there? You know, it's, it's something that is so clear. And those kinds of examples, when you live through them and you understand them, help you appreciate that in those situations, if you can identify when negative reinforcement's happening, you might behave differently rather than behave as I did in that situation. Yeah, you, you're you're too hard on yourself, Rick. And I, I think we've all, anybody who's interacted with kids, uh, whether you're a teacher, parent, anybody who's interacted with kids or anybody who's interacted with other people, we get caught in these moments where we have a desire for something to stop. Mm-hmm. And we will do if we're caught off guard, if we're not in the right state, if we don't understand, if we haven't learned about these principles, we're quick to react because we want that to stop. You know, I used to joke, I used to joke and I used to be very judgmental until. You get in these moments where just like you said, it doesn't matter how much you know about behavior. You get caught and we make mistakes and the best thing we can do is in future situations change and not give in yeah. and uh, or understand if that's what they want, tie that thing to asking appropriately. Think about how many kids they learn very quickly in life. If they went up to you or an adult and said – I would like to go out with my friends this weekend very nicely like that. It's very easy to say what, Rick? Sure. No, it's easy to say no. But if I come up to you and say, come on, I want to go out with my friends, it's then fine, 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 just go. So they learn very quickly when I ask the right way, I'm not provided the outlet. I'm not provided the consequence I want, but you teach me. Me, me being the kid, you teach me if I whine, if I cry, if I yell, you'll give in just to make me go away. So I learn those bad habits. Mm-hmm. And what happens as the parent is you get frustrated and frustrated and then you go to the next level and you don't just say yes. You get more upset. You see emotional responses. And so understanding this response early, understanding the power of positive reinforcement and then its relationship with negative reinforcement in these situations really can make a difference. I think that we do have something that is very new that no other generation of parents has ever had to deal with, and that is social media. Mm -hmm. And on social media, the cameras are always out and – it's weird when you see people like, whipping out their camera to you know, capture a kid tantruming or you know, a, a parent and a child having a negative interaction. And that just ramps up the pressure to – if you're in a public place, like at least when I did my instance of, of knowing the negative reinforcement I did, that lives within me. But – you know, nowadays, if that were a particular, you know, someone had their camera out, I might be on YouTube forever. Yeah, that is so true. And that's another contingency that's on you. And that, you know, understanding how valuable this knowledge is and conveying that knowledge maybe prevents some of that because you're, you're, you can't prevent it all, but you can work on these things in the, you know, in, in private situations and not get, you know, invest more time and energy by providing positives for the things we want while refraining from providing those positives for the things we don't want or employing more negative reinforcement for inappropriate behavior. So, right. I, I mean, it's it's not an easy job. 
Awareness is step number one. Knowledge would be step number two. And then practical action would be step number three. If we can equip parents with that, I feel that we're really doing them a great service. Not only have we given them the power of positive reinforcement, we've also allowed them to understand what comes with negative reinforcement. Doug, our last session or topic couldn't be, we couldn't pass this up, but that is discussing punishment. And by punishment, let's, let's start off from the very beginning and note that when you are a parent, you use discipline. And discipline is a word that when some people think, at least in terms of behavior analysis, oh, you know, these behavior analysts are all about punishment and their discipline is harsh, they don't quite get the relationship between discipline and punishment. They're not the same thing. How are they different, my good sir? How are they different? Well, discipline means to teach and punishment means to punish. And there's even a distinction between what we talk about as behavior analysts regarding punishment and what's kind of thought about punishment in the world. So punishment uh, from a behavior analytic standpoint is uh, type one, type two, or positive, negative. This means that the behavior is there's a stimulus applied or it's removed and it decreases in frequency. Yelling, screaming, or taking away things and grounding in rooms and all the things that people would equate with punishment may or may not have those effects on the behavior. Mm -hmm. So you can do all that stuff. Well, I'm not suggesting you do, but if you do that and behavior is not changing, you're not doing punishment. And I'm not suggesting we do punishment, but understanding again, the having the frame of reference, we're looking at how often a behavior is occurring. And if it's not decreasing, you're not doing punishment. Then you're just using aversives or you're being – Oh, take for example, kids whining. That's it. I'm sending you to the room. If they want to be away from you, they just learned a quick way, whine, go to the room. But you know what? I'm punishing them. I'm sending them to the room. Well, guess what? He doesn't have to be around you anymore. If that may be what he wants. So if – He's whining, and you're sending him in his room. It's not punishment. That is such a good point. From the perspective of a parent, a parent may react in anger and do something, and the parent may even try to punish. And when I say punish, we don't necessarily mean the technical aspect of behavior analysis. We just mean punishment, which could be – someone just delivering an aversive, but if it is not decreasing the future probability of behavior, it doesn't fit our rule. And what happens, unfortunately, is that punishment, let's say a parent scolds a child, and then that really doesn't have the intended effect that they would like. What will happen is you'll see a ramping, a ramping mm -hmm. up of whatever oh, yeah. that thing is. And the next thing you know, it is something ugly. Mm -hmm. And you see this process. So you can go back to, I mean, this is frustrating. When you combine everything, when you're looking at, so you got a child, he's whining, and you begin to teach that child, it's okay to whine because you give them what they want. And that's th that gets them quiet because that's negative reinforcement. Then you decide, I'm so frustrated giving in on you. That's it. You're not allowed to whine anymore. I'm, I'm not giving it to you, and you're in trouble. And they keep whining. And now I'm getting more and more mad to add more and more punishment, and, and whining continues to go, and it gets worse and worse. And now the kid is very upset with you. You're very upset with them. But what happened is, is when you step back and look through a behavior analytic lens, you've – and, well, I didn't even say. Every once in a while, you start to get, you still give in, even though you're mad all the other times. Well, now you've put that whining through negative reinforcement into what you think is punishment, but you've stretched it out. So, understanding these roles of the consequences 
and the child's behavior is imperative for the relationship between the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. And that re that's a good term when you talk about relationships. What we know, and, and you and I, we, I think we may have said this earlier, but if we didn't, I'll say it again. You and I both were, we met as graduate students at Ohio State, and back then in our formative years, we were reading things like Murray Sidman, Coercion and its Fallout, and he so nicely points out that if you're using punishment and you're coercing people, that that leads to very harmful and, frankly, ineffective practices, and you are not going to be developing a positive relationship with that person. And the more you do it, the more you – you could eventually just completely ruin that relationship for life. Yes. Yeah, so there's there's many people have written and study, and this is some of the stuff that um, – I've worked with my doc students and in, in classrooms with teachers, but you fall into what could be termed a coercive cycle. So you've got a situation, you want something to stop or you punish, so you raise that bar. And I don't want to give any ideas of what that bar is. You're just getting – you're putting some more pressure to stop some behavior. Well, what's happening is this response to that behavior is kids tend to – Avoid, get, you know, response to this is avoid, get even, escape. And so if they're getting even, so they're giving you more guff back. And now you got to raise that bar. So you started with a nice long lecture. And the kid's like, forget you. Then you're like, well, I'm embarrassed now. So now you got to start to get mad. And I forget you again. And then they get nasty and they, and you just have to keep raising that bar. And then at the end of the day, how, as you mentioned, what does that relationship look like? Can you walk up to that child and say, hey, can you just do this for me? Or is there so much frustration and anger, it's hard to see past all that? Yeah, there are more and more studies that are coming out mm -hmm. that show the incredibly negative effects of spanking, for example. Oh. When we talk about spanking, we would classify that as a type one punishment or mm -hmm. the delivery of an aversive stimulus. And reading that literature, they'll do large scale studies and the trauma, the psychological fallout, the, the, the greater probability that that person is going to punish their children. It's yeah. just negative after negative after negative. I mean, when you're that parent and you're in that setting, it feels good because you have this thing that you don't like for whatever reason. You apply punishment and it quickly stops, especially if that punishment is, is you know, aversive and it's powerful enough. And what we know is that punishment is not going to be a a long term solution. So the more you punish, the the higher you have to you have to crank it up, mm -hmm. and that's how all of these negative things are going to happen. And it's just something that when we talk to parents, we we must make them aware of what punishment is and what is the fallout associated with it. Yeah, the um, one of the one of the things that, because this this goes back to what I would what I was doing many years ago when I was working with families and doing parenting training parents and and working with that group and one of the people that really did some research on this was Latham Glenn Latham mm -hmm. and uh, he he said really nice thing is coercion breeds short term compliance with long term loss and mm -hmm. when you over rely on these techniques it's so hard to see that loss over time because you are seeing that initial win that initial quiet that initial i get i get the way i want it. i get what i want in this moment and you don't realize that you're losing as that time goes on. And again, this is you know, this is all together. You can't just teach 
I mean, going back to the first, you can't just teach a parent to use positive reinforcement without the understanding of all the principles. You can't just teach, well, refrain from being, you know, refrain from using negative reinforcement. No, you can't. You have to do everything. They work together. They are principles of behavior analysis. They're not just the one good idea. So the, um, it's, it's frustrating, but it's, I understand and I see that because most people don't know those effects. They see them, but they don't realize them. Mm -hmm. And educating parents on punishment also, if you've ever watched any of those nanny shows, the super nanny always comes out and uses timeout. And parents should learn what is timeout, how to do it properly if they're going to use it, what is response cost, how do you use that. I, I remember early on when I was dabbling in doing some parent training early on in my career that someone asked me, oh, I, I was reading this article on timeout, and it said for every year that your child is alive, that's how many seconds the child should be in timeout. So if, you're, if your child – or no, it was minutes. So if your child <laughs> was one years old – You'd put them in there for one minute. If your child was five years old, they'd be in timeout for five minutes. That kind of nonsense is not based on anything clinical. It's just someone who doesn't know behavior analysis and doesn't know how to use the principles in what they are. Yeah, I, I always bring this back to if you're using timeout or response cost and the behavior's not stopping, you're not using punishment. It's not being effective. Too often, these punishments are used as a reinforcement for us, right? Send the kid that's whining to his room because I want a break. And then we so – I'm going to go to time out in your room because I don't want to hear you complain anymore. And guess what? They'll complain again in a little bit. But if it's effective, they won't complain anymore. But we know that case. So, again, comes back to data. Are you collecting data on that and is it decreasing? But, yes, there is a lot of, um, you know, the overused, misused technique called timeout. Let's face it. Parenting is not mm -hmm. easy. But when we help parents understand the science of behavior, they are on much sure footing and – Many good things can happen by understanding behavior analysis and applying it thoughtfully and mindfully. Well, this concludes Episode 6 of ABA on Call. Join us next time, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Central Reach ABA On Call podcast with Drs. Rick Abina and Doc Kostowitz. This is verbal behavior and... You can find the show notes for this episode on centralreach.com slash ABA On Call. Please stay connected with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by following at Central Reach and subscribe on the podcast player of your choice.